Welcome back to this new edition of News Today. Without delay, let's explore the headlines first. 50th Group of Seven Summit concludes. The Prime Minister held a bilateral meeting with his Japanese counterpart. China's grey zone warfare tactics. Untapped collective intelligence for climate action report has been released. WHO designates CCRAS and IIMH collaborating center for traditional medicine research. Pacific Ocean is free from El Nino conditions, says National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Ahead in the news, the 50th Group of Seven Summit has just concluded, and there's a lot to unpack from this significant gathering. Hosted by Italy, this year's summit was marked by crucial discussions and groundbreaking initiatives. Notably, India participated in the G7 outreach session on key topics like artificial intelligence, energy, Africa, and Mediterranean. Let's dive into the key outcomes and their implications. One of the major highlights of the summit was the launch of the G7 Apulia Food Systems Initiative. This initiative aims to intensify efforts to overcome structural barriers to food security and nutrition. Another critical development is the Partnership for Global Infrastructure Investment, a joint initiative of G7 countries. The goal is to mobilize up to 600 billion USD by 2027 to help fund infrastructure projects in developing countries through both public and private investments. On the front of technological advancement, the G7 announced plans to develop a brand to support the implementation of the International Code of Conduct for organizations developing advanced AI systems. Now, let's talk about the G7 summit itself. The G7 is an informal forum that brings together Italy, Canada, France, Germany, Japan, the United Kingdom, and the United States of America. The European Union also participates in the summit. Established as a platform for economic and financial cooperation in response to the 1973 energy crisis, the first summit was held in 1975. Interestingly, the group expanded into the G8 between 1997 and 2013 with the inclusion of Russia. However, Russia's participation was suspended in 2014 following the annexation of Crimea. The G7 does not have a permanent administrative structure, which makes it a unique and flexible forum for addressing global issues. Why is the G7 so relevant? Their collective economic power allows them to shape global economic policies, coordinate financial regulations, and address significant economic challenges such as trade imbalances, currency stability, and financial crisis. The launch of the PGII is seen as a response to China's Belt and Road Initiative, highlighting the G7's strategic economic influence. The G7 has also played a key role in the creation of international financial institutions like the Financial Action Task Force, further emphasizing its critical role in global economic governance. In conclusion, the 50th G7 summit has set the stage for significant global initiatives in food security, infrastructure investment, and ethical AI development. As these initiatives unfold, they will undoubtedly shape the future of global cooperation and economic stability. Ahead in the news, the bilateral meeting between the Prime Minister of India and his Japanese counterpart held on the sidelines of the G7 summit in Apulia, Italy, underscored the deepening ties and converging interests of these two major democracies, especially in the context of the evolving geopolitical landscape in the Indo-Pacific region, marked by the rise of China. Let us first start by looking at the key dimensions of bilateral cooperation. Politically, since the year 2014, India-Japan relationship has seen a remarkable growth and development over the past decade, evolving into what is now termed as a special strategic and global partnership. The establishment of the India-Japan Act East Forum has been a significant milestone as this forum serves as a platform for collaborative efforts under India's Act East policy and Japan's vision of a free and open Indo-Pacific. Economically, the Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement between the two countries has been a cornerstone of bilateral trade, which reached a notable $21.96 billion US dollars during the fiscal year 2022-23. Additionally, Japan has consistently been a key economic partner for India, being the largest source of Japanese official development assistance loans for decades. In the realm of security, India and Japan have established robust mechanisms for defence cooperation. The Foreign and Defence Ministerial Meeting, also known as the 2 plus 2 meeting, is a crucial platform for strategic dialogue. Furthermore, the Bilateral Logistics Agreement facilitates reciprocal provision of supplies and services between the defence forces of both nations. Joint military exercises such as Weed Guardian, Dharma Guardian and the Malabar Naval Exercises further strengthen their defence partnerships. Infrastructure development is another vital area of collaboration. One of the flagship projects is the Mumbai Ahmedabad High Speed Rail Project, epitomizing high level of technical and financial cooperation. 
Additionally, the Japan-India Clean Energy Partnership aiming to promote sustainable energy solutions. Beyond bilateral cooperation, India and Japan are also active partners in various multilateral initiatives. They jointly champion the Asia-Africa Growth Corridor aimed at fostering economic connectivity and development across Asia and Africa. Both countries are key members of the Quadrilateral Security Dialogue and the India-Japan-Australia Supply Chain Resilience Initiative, which seek to enhance regional security and economic resilience. Furthermore, Japan's participation in India-led initiatives like the International Solar Alliance and the Coalition for Disaster Resilient Infrastructure highlights their shared vision for a sustainable and resilient global community. In summary, from political and economic collaboration to security and infrastructure projects, India and Japan's cooperation continues to grow, driven by mutual interest and a shared vision for a stable and prosperous Indo-Pacific region. In our next news, we are diving into a critical topic that has significant implications for global security, China's grey zone warfare tactics. These tactics are being deployed in various regions including Taiwan, the South China Sea and India's boundary disputes to achieve strategic objectives. So what exactly is grey zone warfare? It refers to the ambiguous space that exists between direct conflict and peace. The aim here is to harm an adversary without them feeling threatened or even realizing they are under attack. This involves both conventional and non-conventional means of warfare. How does this work? Actions like salami slicing involve small military actions to conquer opposition territory piece by piece. It also includes nefarious economic activities such as sanctions, cyber attacks, psychological operations like disinformation campaigns and the use of proxy forces. Now the question arises what makes grey zone warfare particularly insidious? First, it operates below the threshold of war using non-military tools that don't justify a military response. The tactics unfold gradually over years or even decades, reducing opportunities for a decisive counter-response. There's also a lack of attributability as the aggressor often doesn't accept responsibility for these activities, distracting potential responses. Targets are usually vulnerable countries that have little scope for retaliation due to domestic or strategic reasons. Given these characteristics, now let's understand what measures are required to counter grey zone warfare. Active monitoring and sharing of information between like-minded countries is crucial. Deterrence through capability demonstration and fostering a rule-based order are also essential. Now, let's turn our focus to India's preparedness against grey zone warfare. The Chief of Defence Staff coordinates the workings of the Indian Army, Air Force and Navy to ensure a unified response. Promoting self-reliance in defence manufacturing through initiatives like the Defence Procurement Procedure 2020 is another key step. India is also enhancing cooperation with like-minded countries. For instance, agreements like the General Security of Military Information Agreement with the US play a pivotal role. Other measures include the establishment of the Indian Computer Emergency Response Team to tackle cyber threats. In conclusion, China's grey zone warfare tactics present a complex and evolving challenge. By understanding these tactics and implementing robust countermeasures, countries can better protect their sovereignty and strategic interests. In our next news, a new report released by the United Nations Development Programme explores the untapped potential of collective intelligence in climate action. This report delves into how CI initiatives can significantly enhance climate adaptation and mitigation efforts. Let's take a closer look at the key points. Collective intelligence or CI is the enhanced capacity that emerges when people work together, often with the aid of technology, to mobilize a diverse range of information, ideas and insights. This collaborative effort can create solutions that are greater than the sum of their parts. The report highlights the immense potential of CI in addressing climate challenges. CI can effectively bridge several critical gaps in climate action. Firstly, the data gap. By mobilizing citizens to generate real-time localized data, CI initiatives can bring together diverse data sets, uncovering new insights and enhancing our understanding of climate issues. Secondly, the doing gap. CI can engage more people in taking climate actions and help monitor the follow-through of institutions. And lastly, the diversity gap. CI can bring in a wider range of voices, including those from indigenous communities into climate processes and data collection, enriching the diversity of perspectives and solutions. Additionally, CI can decrease several critical gaps. The distance gap as CI fosters a two-way exchange between scientists and local communities, enhancing scientific understanding, public knowledge and mutual trust. 
and the decision making gap as ci helps close gaps between opposing views and interests such as climate action versus economic growth speeding up necessary climate actions examples of ci in action in india are already demonstrating its potential if we talk about the agrili app then it provides real time weather monitoring and crop information to help farmers decide which crops to grow thereby enhancing agricultural resilience secondly the water associated infectious diseases in india initiative focuses on disease surveillance for water borne diseases helping to prevent and manage outbreaks moreover the geo ai open data platform maps the entire brick kiln belt in india currently being used in bihar to better target and address environmental policy violations and lastly the data in climate resilient agriculture platform that's developed by UNDP India this platform identifies best regional strategies for food security in conclusion the untapped collective intelligence for climate action report by UNDP highlights the transformative potential of ci initiatives in bridging critical gaps and accelerating climate action Ahead in the news, the World Health Organization has designated the National Institute of Indian Medical Heritage or NIIMH as its first collaborating center for fundamental and literary research in traditional medicine known as CCIND 177. This prestigious recognition will be in effect for 4 years starting from June 3, 2024. Let's delve into the responsibilities that come with this designation. As CCIND 177 NIIMH will assist WHO in several key areas. Firstly they will help standardize terminologies for Ayurveda, Unani, Siddha and Soa Ritpa traditional medicine systems that have a rich history in India. Additionally, NIIMH will aid in updating the traditional medicine module 2 for the 11th edition of the International Classification of Diseases or ICD-11. For those unfamiliar, the ICD is the international standard for the systematic recording, reporting, analysis, interpretation and comparison of mortality and morbidity data. It also includes a dedicated chapter on traditional medicine. Specifically, module 2 of this supplementary chapter focuses on Ayurveda, Siddha and Unani data and terminology. Moreover, NIIMH will support member states in developing research methodologies for traditional medicine, further cementing its role in global health research. A bit about NIIMH. It was established in 1956 and operates under the Central Council for Research in Ayurvedic Sciences, which is part of the Ministry of Ayush. Its mandate is to document and showcase medical historical research in Ayurveda, yoga, naturopathy, Unani, Siddha and other related healthcare disciplines in India. NIIMH has already been proactive in promoting traditional medicine research through various initiatives. They published the Journal of Indian Medical Heritage and have launched several digital initiatives. The Amar portal catalogs 16000 Ayush manuscripts including digitized manuscripts and rare books. The National Ayush Morbidity and Standardized Terminologies Electronic Portal provides standardized terminologies and morbidity codes for Ayurveda, Siddha and Unani systems of medicine. Additionally, the showcase of Ayurvedic historical imprints portal displays various medical historical artifacts. They also offer e-books of Ayush and an Ayush research portal. In conclusion, the designation of NIIMH as a WHO collaborating center marks a significant milestone in the global recognition and integration of traditional medicine. Moving on to the next news. In a significant climate update, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, a US body, has announced that the El Niño conditions, which had been prevalent since mid 2023, have officially ended. We are now experiencing an El Niño Southern Oscillation neutral phase. Now let's delve into what this means and its implications. ENSO or the El Niño Southern Oscillation is a recurring climate pattern involving changes in the temperature of waters in the central and Eastern Tropical Pacific Ocean. This cycle occurs irregularly, typically every 2 or 7 years. The extreme phases of this cycle are known as El Niño, the warm phase, and La Niña, the cold phase, with a third phase called Enso neutral occurring between them. In the Enso neutral phase, tropical Pacific sea surface temperatures are generally close to average, indicating a more stable climate and condition without the extreme temperature deviations seen in El Niño and La Niña phases. El Niño, which translates to the Christ child, is a climate pattern associated with the warming of ocean surfaces temperatures in the central and eastern tropical Pacific Ocean. This phenomenon has several key impacts. It often leads to a weaker monsoon season in India, resulting in reduced rainfall across the subcontinent. Globally, it typically brings increased rainfall to South America while causing drought conditions in Indonesia and Australia. 
Conversely, La Nina meaning the little girl refers to the periodic cooling of ocean surface temperatures in the central and east central equatorial Pacific. Its impacts are the opposite of those caused by El Nino. La Nina is associated with a strong monsoon and above average rains and colder winters in the subcontinent. To sum up, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration's announcement of the shift to an ENSO neutral phase marks the end of the recent El Nino conditions. This change brings a period of more stable weather patterns with critical implications for global and regional climates, particularly in India. The personality news for today is Tarak Nath Das. He is in news as recently the birth anniversary of Sri Tarak Nath Das was celebrated. He was born in North 24 Pargana, Bengal. Moreover, he was a journalist, teacher, philanthropist and a revolutionary. Talking about his key contributions, in the year 1903, he joined the revolutionary organization Anushilan Samiti, which was established by Satish Chandra Bose and P. Mitra in Kolkata. He started an anti-British newspaper, Free Hindustan, in the USA. Moreover, in 1913, he was associated with the Gadar movement. He also implicated in the Indo-German conspiracy case in 1917. He established Tariknath Das Foundation in 1935 to promote educational activities to foster cultural relations between the US and Asian countries. Through his actions, he exemplified the values of dedication, courage, determination, vision and selflessness. As we conclude today's main news, let's have a look at some quick updates. India and Indian Ocean Rim Association Cruise Tourism Conference held in New Delhi. IORA is an intergovernmental organization established in 1997 and based on the visions of Nelson Mandela, it has 23 members including India. The National Stock Exchange Chief cautioned retail investors against derivatives trading. Derivatives are financial contracts that draw their value from an underlying asset. In India, the derivative market is regulated by the Securities and Exchange Board of India. The National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration forecasts an above-average summer dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico. Dead zone is an area of low oxygen that can kill fish and other marine life. A startup has developed an AI tool, Divya Drishti. Divya Drishti creates a robust and multifaceted authentication system by combining facial recognition with gait analysis. Researchers have shown the potential of freshwater biodiversity monitoring using eDNA. eDNA is an organismal DNA that is released in the environment from cellular material shed by organisms into aquatic or terrestrial environments. This information can be used to inform the IUCN Red List of threatened species and other conservation tools. India's TrueNAT platform for TB detection received appreciation at the World Health Assembly. TrueNAT platform is a handheld battery operated real time rapid molecular test for the diagnosis of pulmonary, extrapulmonary, and rifampicin resistant tuberculosis. Indian Army received first indigenous loitering munition suicide drones Nagastra 1. Nagastra 1 developed by Solar Industries Economics Explosives Limited, Nagpur. It can neutralize hostile threats in kamikaze mode with GPS enabled precision strikes with an accuracy of up to 2 meters. The Kavli Prize winners were announced honoring breakthroughs in astrophysics, nanoscience, and neuroscience. Kavli Prize is a biennial award established by Norwegian-American philanthropist Fred Kavli. Before we wrap up today's bulletin, it's time to put your knowledge to test in today's segment of Test Your Learning. Thank you for joining us. We hope you enjoyed this edition of News Today. For the solutions to today's quiz and to access the PDF version of News Today, remember to visit the provided links in the description below.